in the name of the one God, creator, redeemer, and sanctifier. You mean to tell me that no one is responsible for the death of Breonna Taylor? Not Brett Hankison, not Miles Cosgrove, not Jonathan Mattingly, the three officers who, armed with a no-knock warrant, entered her home and murdered her in cold blood while she slept. You mean to tell me that property damage means more than black lives, than our lives? This past Wednesday, only one officer, Brett Hankison, was indicted. For that matter, he was charged with wanton endangerment or recklessly firing his gun, not because Breonna Taylor was murdered, but because the bullets destroyed property and endangered neighbors. Beloved, sadly, we still make use of the proverb that the Lord God bade Ezekiel tell Israel to lay aside. We have eaten and still eat sour grapes, and our children's teeth are set on edge. The tang of the sour grapes of white supremacy and white privilege, systemic racism and injustice, oppression and inequity lingers in our mouths. Our children's teeth are set on edge because they are not allowed to fail, because they have indelible targets placed on their backs because there are still those in our society who do not appreciate their right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Yet even now, beloved, especially now, the God who inspired Joseph's dreams in the pit the God who freed the Hebrew children, the God who toppled the walls of Jericho, the God who delivered Daniel from the lion's den, the God who tabernacled in human flesh, taught, healed, suffered, bled, died, and got up again, the God who wept for Trayvon, Tanisha, Philando, Sandra, Tamir, Botham, Eric, Gabriella, Ahmad, George, and Brianna is with us. For ours is not a high priest who is unfamiliar with or untouched by our weakness and infirmity, our trials and our struggles. No, beloved, our high priest, Jesus, innocence personified, was lynched on a tree on a garbage heap just outside the city of David. Jesus felt the lash of oppression. Jesus tasted the sour grapes of injustice. Jesus' teeth were set on edge by inequity, suffering, and death. Jesus was murdered by those who shirked their solemn oath to protect him. Jesus, the herald of Eastertide, knew full well the misery and pain of this Good Friday world. And this Jesus, the one who still bears the scars of his lynching, the one who has overcome this Good Friday world, bids us follow him to take up his cross and so transform the world. Beloved, God's word, so Ezekiel tells us, assures us that God takes no pleasure in anyone's death and bids us 
to turn away from, reject, and oppose all systems, forces, institutions, and death-dealing modalities that seek to fracture, estrange, and destroy the human family. And yes, we are even called to stand against those people who would oppress and kill. Because at bottom, systems and institutions are but instruments of oppression. People oppress, maim, and murder. And so, beloved, in turning away from all these, we turn to God. We embrace the life of Jesus and so face and take up the cross. The cross that is the ultimate sign of protest. The incomparable standard of justice. The quintessential emblem of freedom. The eternal edict of love. And taking up the cross of Jesus does not mean that we must explain our anger, disgust, dissatisfaction, distrust, confusion, doubts, or our fears. No, beloved, taking up the cross of Jesus means that we channel all these things into a deep, abiding commitment to love the hell out of each other and our neighbors. Make no mistake. The work to which we are now called, taking up the cross of Jesus, is and will continue to be slow, difficult work and inevitably will demand immense patience and require hard sacrifices. The mind-changing, heart-fixing, and soul healing that is the substance of Jesus' mission and message always is. And yet, this work is necessary. And beloved, only as we commit to this work, only as we recognize that without God we can do nothing, can the church universal, the Episcopal Church, indeed St. Paul's Episcopal Church, be a visible and vibrant, empowering and emancipated church, visible in the community and the world in service and in protest, vibrant in praise and worship and genuine care for and love of one another, empowering in our ministry to the whole person and emancipated from spiritual, societal, and cultural chains. And yes, yes, there will always be those like the chief priests and elders from Matthew's Gospel, whose minds and hearts and souls will remain unchanged. Those who are sometimes hateful, usually stupid, and always, always wrong, whose comfort with a form of godliness belies a sinister collaboration with and perpetuation of systems of oppression, injustice, and death. Nevertheless, beloved, we must, we must, we must Heed blessed Paul's exhortation. Do not grow weary in well-doing, for we will reap at harvest time if we do not give up. So don't give up, St. Paul's. Don't give out, St. Paul's. Don't give in, St. Paul's. For we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. And if you are looking for this great cloud of witnesses, friends, you need look no farther than yourselves. For you, yes you, are a great cloud of witnesses. 
Eva Bird, who truly walks hand in hand with the Lord. Fletcher Coombs, who is the embodiment of the Davidic Psalm, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go down to the house of the Lord. Ricky Woods, a tireless servant whose commitment to feeding bodies, minds, hearts, and souls is unwavering. Sharon Haley, whose commitment to making others well is genuine and unflinching. Ken Singleton, who trained up generations of parishioners in committed service to and worship of our Lord. Carol Stone Taylor, whose commitment to always show up to service witnesses the celebrity, wonder, and majesty of our God. David Taylor, a humble student of history who understands that without vision, people perish. Benita Nobles, who quietly, with cards, words of encouragement, and messages of hope, reaches out to us, and in so doing, really reaches in and touches each and every one of our hearts. Brian and Jennifer Butte, who recognize that stewardship is about more than money, that stewardship is about seeing everything as gift and surrendering all to God. Azizi Ivy, a drum major for justice and truth, love and reconciliation, who reminds our youth that they are young, gifted, black, beautiful children of God. Peter Wilborn, who is on the front lines of the fight against COVID-19, and before that served in the Peace Corps overseas. Shelby Singleton, who in one conversation reminded me how wonderful being in love with God is. Matthew and Marilyn Butte, Mariko and Akil Shaw, Elise and Adina Adams, Alexandra and Ariana Stevens, and Olivia Brooks, whose kindness and wisdom, whose compassionate mentorship is truly a light to our children and youth, and Corey Harmon, who in the face of all this madness, unashamedly declared, I may be young, but I feel powerful. So yes, St. Paul's, surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, we shall run this race with perseverance, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, recognizing that faith which does not require radical engagement with the world is no faith at all. So we march on. We continue in ministry because it is as Josiah Gilbert Holland wrote, and I now paraphrase, a time like this demands strong minds great hearts, true faith, and ready hands, followers of Jesus whom the lust of office does not kill, ministers whom the spoils of office cannot buy, Christians who possess opinions and a will, who have honor and will not lie, who can stand before a demagogue and damn his treacherous flatteries without winking, tall lovers of God, sun crowned who live above the fog in public duty and private thinking, for freedom weeps, wrong rules the land, and waiting justice sleeps. So beloved St. Paul's, we march on, we continue in ministry, we keep our hands to the plow, and we hold on to the God of hope, the God of love, the God of our faith, who has never, ever left us or forsaken us. We keep our hands to the plow, and we hold on 
to the hem of Jesus' garment until we are finally, finally, finally made whole. So let it be. Amen.